slightly go solo. I just wish it wouldn't make that noise. James. Oh, God. What? <laughs> Please tell me that. You bloody idiot. Why did you think two batteries was the right solution? Oh, great. We're actually holding people up uh, here. Sorry. Sorry. I can't. <sighs> Come on, Jeff. Come on. The class 91 is a wait, hold on a second. That's not a 91. Let's try that again. The class 91 is a 1980s British high speed electric locomotive that typically runs as a train formation known as the Intercity 225. Built in crew as a procurement for the then newly electrified East Coast Main Line, the 91 was the flagship Intercity train for said route, responsible for connecting London and Scotland with the northeast of England, ensuring that Newcastle doesn't financially sink into the North Sea overnight. Recent years have seen its position get sidelined due to IET Chan, and thus nowadays it can be seen exclusively serving places such as Wakefield, Leeds, Grantham, Bradford, York, London King's Cross and Newark Northgate. So what do I think of these intercity trains? And do I think they deserve to have been laid off like this? Let's find out. Unlike most of the trains we've looked at in this series, the IC225 is a loco hauled formation. Sort of similar to the HST. A loco haul train can have advantages over using multiple units, but issues can quickly start happening once we arrive at our final stop and need to turn the train around. How do you solve this problem? We could detach the loco and move it to the other end of the train. This is something that the 91 is more than capable of doing, even if it results in a lower top speed, if running with the blunt end first. This however would require the rebuilding and re-signaling of a handful of stations, just to ensure it can run around to the opposite end. We could stick a locomotive on each end of the train. This is a practice still continued to this day with not only the HST, but also in Europe in countries such as Belgium and the Netherlands. Despite the extra power benefits, as well as reversibility of a consist, at the end of the day here, we are buying twice as many locomotives and we can't spend that much money for the north. Not without getting beaten up by the Yorkshire Building Society at least. So instead we must seek out a third option. Introducing the driving van trailer, or DVT for short. Placed at the London facing end of a consist, this control car looks like a 91, but has no engine or traction motors to speak of, instead it uses a combination of cables and witchcraft, to control the 91 from the other end of the train. The 91 is literally pushing the train in this formation, hence why it's called push-pull, and the result of that is easier turnarounds at terminus stations and still retaining the usual top speed of before. In the interest of fairness, the idea of a DVT, or control car is nothing new. This is a concept that has been used as far back as the early 1900s with the likes of GWR and their auto coaches. But either way, it's nice to still see the idea live on well into the 21st century. In terms of appearance, the Intercity 225 looks pretty good I must say. The 91 locomotive itself looks very sleek in terms of design, and the Mark IV coaches use look and sound better than the Mark III's if you ask me, especially at speed. I also like how the 91 sounds when starting up. The cooling fans sound like they would fit right at home on a gaming laptop. Stick in some RGBs in, and you're all set. I don't think the Intercity 225 has appeared in any bad livery since introduction. I could probably pick any livery at random, and still like it to some extent. What's that? We do not talk about 91125. That livery never existed. Anyway, the 91 is fast. To the absolute shock of nobody, the Intercity 225 qualifies as a high speed train with a top speed of 125 miles per hour. They were actually designed to reach 140, but due to infrastructure limitations and a distinctive lack of cab signaling, this was never achieved in service. That being said, the 91 holds the UK record for fastest locomotive as it reached a whopping 161 miles per hour during testing. Yes this was downhill, but a record is a record nonetheless. The only thing seriously holding the 91 back is its acceleration, which you can probably tell by the footage here. Its maximum rate of 0.21 meters per second square is, well, crap. 
and it's no surprise that other multiple units can easily beat it to top speed. Still, as long as there's no overhead line fault on the East Coast Main Line, the 91 will happily cruise around at 125 miles per hour every day. So what are the Mark IV coaches like to ride on? This time we are going to do things a little bit differently. You see, when I was traveling to Peterborough one day to ride on some Delane buses, I found out that according to the East Coast Main Line, what qualifies as an advance ticket seems rather odd. As in, if your train departs in half an hour, it's an advance ticket. What does this mean exactly? Simple, affordable first class tickets. Thus I'm able to experience the first class service on board in proper instead of just hastily walking through and touching up the seats. A typical intercity 225 set has 9 coaches, 5 standard, 1 including a buffet and the remaining 3 for first class. As we look through standard class, we are presented with a smart looking 2 plus 2 seating arrangement in each coach, with luggage spaces, provided in overhead racks, and at the end of the coaches where applicable. Tables are provided behind the seat switch fold, and are at an acceptable size. Obviously the tables at facing seats are at a much bigger size, large enough to play Dungeons and Dragons on. Three pin charging sockets are provided for you to power up your toaster with, but no USB charging ports because lol. As this is an intercity train in the UK, seat reservations are a thing and the displays are located right above the seats with vibrant displays. You already know my thoughts on seat reservations, so I won't waste any more time on that. One thing I like is that the vestibule doors in the coaches can be opened using telekinetic power, as I shall demonstrate. Okay. Thank you. Nice investment I must say. Another nice investment is the fitting of these television displays that finally give you visual train information for the passengers. They weren't working when I filmed this, because the train wasn't ready for service yet. The toilets on board are what you would expect. One water closet is located at one end of the coach, in the rather spacious vestibule I must say. These standard toilets are a bit on the small side, feeling roughly similar in size to the class 390. The main difference here being, that it's a sliding door instead of a swiveling inward door. A much more sensible idea if you ask me. At the very least, they work and I have yet to be abducted and held hostage in one. The disabled toilets are located in coach L4 first class and coach F4 standard class. They are located right next to the disabled space in the coach and are of a good size to practice Sailor Moon transformations. No issues here to speak of. The disabled space in the coach is of a large size with neat folding seats adjacent them. Charging sockets are still provided here too, which is very nice. Moving along to the buffet car, a selection of food and beverages can be purchased on your journey or even ordered directly to your seat. If you're too lazy, the prices are pretty good. At least when compared to the housing rent in shortage. Look at that. £4.10 for a bacon roll. Twice as much as it would cost from Greg's. Feel free to read the menu prices from LNER's website, and I'll be there to watch you in complete shock and awe. It's time to finally look at what first class has to offer. Now this, ladies and mentalchen, is what we call first class. We get all the previous amenities of standard class, but now with leather seats, bigger armrests, curtains and 2 plus 1 seating throughout. I love this interior so much. Sitting in these marvelous leather seats makes me feel like wearing a top hat. The seats in standard class were fine enough honestly but this is a whole new level of comfort and relaxation. I love it. When traveling in first class, you are given a complimentary meal of your choosing from the menu that is handed to you by the staff. I had a bacon roll for anyone curious, since there was no way in hell I would buy it from the buffet car. Alongside complimentary food and beverages, you will most likely receive the best option a service can provide. A complimentary Yorkshire accent. Sure, the Orient Express may have the highest level of luxury money can buy on the railway. But do any of their staff have a Yorkshire accent? Didn't think so. Checkmate a gaffer Christie. The future of the 91 and the Mark IV coaches could certainly be a bit brighter. Whilst a handful of sets continue to be operated by London North Eastern Railway today, some have already been sent into storage or donated to the scrap god in recent years. On the flip side, a company called Euro Phoenix purchased a pair of class 91s and repainted them in a sick looking livery. Their plan is supposedly to re-gear then export them to Europe for freight services. An interesting idea and I wish them the best. 
Grand Central attempted to use some Mark IV coaches for a new service from London Euston to Blackpool North. But they changed their minds after realizing that not even Tumbleweeds willingly travel to Blackpool, let alone paying customers. Thus it was cancelled. Transport for Wales have recently acquired some Mark IV coaches and driving van trailers to use on their Cardiff Central to Holyhead Intercity Premier service, hauled using Class 67 diesel locomotives. They don't reach the same speeds, but at least they are actually using them on a sensible service and that's something I can respect. Conclusion. You know what, I really like riding these trains. I didn't ride on them much back in the day due to the lack of time and funds to even touch the East Coast Main Line, but I always saw of riding the Intercity 225 as a well-deserved treat. Air-conditioned coaches with nice seats, good refinement and lovely sounds make for a combination I'd only be happy to give a thumbs up to. Of course I will not deny the improvements the IET has delivered onto the LNER services. Better acceleration, braking, versatility with onboard diesel engines to serve Lincoln, Hull and Harrogate are all good. But I wish it didn't have to come at a cost of comfort on board. Before people ask, I've heard conflicting responses on if the class 90 has better acceleration to the 91 during my research, which can be supported slightly with its lower top speed of 110 miles per hour. But either way, both trains supposedly still take more than 100 seconds to reach 60 under optimal conditions. Make of that what you will, but both are still quite slow at the end of the day. Now you know my thoughts on the Intercity 225. Go out there and continue to keep funding your local Greggs each morning. Remember, a Greggs sausage bap a day keeps the bailiffs and liquidators away.